Hey there, I'm Sarah McLaughlin. Thanks for joining me on the Chaos to Calm podcast, a podcast designed for women over 40 who think that changing hormones might be messing with their mood, metabolism and energy and want to change that in a healthy, sustainable and permanent way. Each episode will explore topics related to health and wellness for women in their 40s, like what the heck is happening to your hormones, what to do about it with nutrition, lifestyle and stress management, and inspiring conversations with guests sharing their insights and tips on how to live your best life in your 40s and beyond. So if you're feeling like you're in the midst of a hormonal storm and don't want perimenopause to be horrific, then join me on Chaos to Calm as I share with you how to make it to menopause without it wrecking your relationships and life. Hello and welcome back to the Chaos to Calm podcast where we talk all things perimenopause and with the aim to make your journey as smooth as possible through to menopause there. This is episode number 34. You're with me, Sarah, the perimenopause naturopath. And today we are going to talk about the black cloud on even the sunniest of days. (laughs) It's one of the most common nutrient deficiencies that I deal with at perimenopause naturopath HQ. It is iron deficiency, right? It's that thing keeping you exhausted, impatient, angry, unfocused, overwhelmed, no mojo, no motivation, and a massive contributor to heavy bleeding. So for a lot of women I talk to and work with, it's a problem they either can't get rid of or they may not know that they have. And, you know, I've seen some incredibly low iron stores in clients and I am amazed at how they pick themselves up and keep going. And I think a lot of that is because we are told, oh, that's normal. You're tired. You're a mum. You're a busy mum. You're working mum. You're going through perimenopause. You're getting older. All those things that we hear, which aren't helpful and really dismiss that there is actually a problem underneath. So as I said, iron is the most prescribed supplement here at the perimenopause naturopath. We don't prescribe a lot, but we sure do prescribe a lot of iron. (laughs) So it is a problem. It's actually a really big problem. World Health Organization lists iron deficiency as a major problem worldwide, especially in developed countries. Like it shouldn't be because we have enough food available, but it actually is. So it tells us it's maybe not all about the food. So I'll introduce you to Carly. She was a client of mine. She was a busy working mum in her 40s, like you, like lots of women I talk with. And yeah, she came to me feeling exhausted, like totally wiped out all the time. And she'd just been told, eh, you know, you're a mum, you work too. That's kind of normal. But she did have a lot of flags for iron deficiency. So she struggled with heavy clotty periods, extremely exhausted, brain fog. Her meals often were just kids leftovers. A big flag for her was she'd recently been diagnosed as a celiac. So she knew she had some gut health issues needing support and resolution. And one of the ways that they'll often diagnose celiacs or get a flag that celiacs is happening is low iron and iron stores. So, you know, Carly did know she was iron deficient, like lots of you are, but she couldn't get rid of it. You know, she was just the symptoms, heavy bleeding, fatigue, muscle weakness, mental fog, no motivation. They're the symptoms she was dealing with. They're the like really common uh, symptoms. And yes, there can be multiple reasons why. That's why it's super important to dive in and get an understanding of is it iron deficiency contributing to how you're feeling or is it something else? Because, you know, like for Carly, she tried so many different things, diet changes, exercise, you know, all of the stuff. Everything persisted for her. She did eat well when she made meals for herself. She was really conscious of eating iron rich foods and all of that sort of thing. But she was really caught in a loop of iron deficiency. She'd done heaps of supplements, got lots of constipation, tried lower dose ones, tried infusions. They made her feel really sick. So it wasn't something she wanted to keep doing. But mostly 
she saw little change and it's because her underlying symptoms or the underlying driver of why she was feeling that way wasn't being addressed. So when we worked together, yep, fast forward a few months, she was feeling a lot better. We increased her ferritin levels by four times, 400% in just a few months. So ferritin is your iron storage protein there as well. And that meant that her periods and were not so heavy or draining anymore there as well. So you know, iron deficiency can be something that kind of creeps up on you and you don't realize just how tired and, and worn out you are until you really stop and think about it or someone draws attention to it. And I know for Carly that was the case. She knew she was tired. She kind of didn't realize how tired she was though and how it was impacting her until we got her levels back up again and she could see what she'd been putting up with as normal was really abnormal. And so her story is certainly not unique, as I've said. So let's explore the risks or the symptoms of iron deficiency. So what puts you at risk of iron deficiency, what the symptoms are and why it can be a bit prevalent in perimenopause. So and I think it's, uh, you know, again, I want you to know what your risk factors are. And I also, when we're talking about what you can do about it, we're going to, of course, dive into how do we resolve the underlying issue? That's what we want to do for that long-term change in your health and that benefit there. So iron deficiency, who's at risk? Well, there's lots of risk factors and the most common ones that women see and that I see in my clients is pregnancy. And yes, probably lots of us are past that, but you know, I've helped plenty of women that have just recently had a baby and now in perimenopause, remember, can start in your mid-30s. So It's not like pregnancy was that long ago for many of you. And it can take like 12 months to replenish your stores after pregnancy. If you've had a hemorrhage or some other complication, um, or if you're not getting enough iron, then, or maybe you've had pregnancies close together, that'll put you more at risk of low iron and low, low stores, low ferritin. So heavy periods, this is something that's really common in the early phases of perimenopause. And unfortunately, it's the one time that our body is not the well-oiled and wonderful machine that I always rave about. (laughs) When you are low in iron, when you're low in your iron stores in ferritin, you will actually have heavier periods. I know when you need that iron the most, you actually lose more. And then, you know, it becomes a vicious cycle. Low iron, heavy bleeding, heavy bleeding, lowers your iron further. And it can be really difficult to keep up your iron supplementing wise, if that's the case, you really need to address that heavy bleeding. We'll talk some more about that in a minute. Vegetarian, vegan diets, you know, so not taking enough in, that can be a problem. High stress levels, why high stress? Is this just a ploy for me to get this in the conversation so early in the episode? Well, no, it's not a ploy, but you know, stress really alters our digestive function and uh, the fire in your guts so it impacts how much you can get out of the food that you're eating and how much you absorb same goes with celiacs especially if you're undiagnosed or if you're not avoiding gluten non-celiac gluten sensitivity those peeps will also be at risk because of the inflammation in your gut and reduced function there going on restrictive diets um, frequently and skipping out on iron rich foods or not eating enough that's going to impact your iron stores uh, and other gut health issues. You know, if you've got an imbalance in your microbiome, maybe you've got a parasite or, you know, some other dysbiosis or bacterial overgrowth and intestinal blood loss. So always have a look when you wipe and when you go. And if it's like bright red blood, well, probably hemorrhoids sister um, or a tear or something like that. If it's darker blood, please do follow, you know, either way, follow it up with your primary care doctor Uh, you need to get it looked at if it is dark blood though please it's really important so lots of factors that women have in their 40s as well and a thyroid condition hypothyroidism will put you at risk of low iron because of the way it impacts your digestive system and your iron metabolism so i just want to touch on why iron is so important because it does a lot in our body 
It's involved in our energy production. It's involved in our thinking, our focus, our concentration. Uh, it's and, and part of that is because it's involved in uh, neurotransmitter production, those brain chemicals that make us, well, particularly dopamine, uh, that give us our mojo and motivation, get us up and going and doing the things that we need to do. And also uh, dopamine is our feel-good or pleasure hormone, a neurotransmitter. So... It's also if we're, you know, you can see why you might have a low mood if you're low in that transmitter and you're low in iron, making you have low levels of dopamine. Iron's really important for your immune function and inflammatory processes and your thyroid hormone levels, as I said. So that's just some of the things that it does. And so totally not a surprise then, is it, that there's lots of different symptoms of iron deficiency. You know, you might be thinking about lethargy or, you know, fatigue and exhaustion, getting short of breath really quickly when you say climb the stairs or, or go for a little walk. Yeah, they're commonplace that reduce stamina, hard to recover from exercise uh, as well. Maybe feel some muscle fatigue and heaviness. Restless legs is a big giveaway, but it can be other things as well. Low mood, and as I talked about, and depression, that poor digestion, it can be slowed and, and it feels like food sits like a brick in your chest and you struggle to digest things like meat. Hair loss, um, falling sick more frequently and, and then not being able to get rid of it so a lingering infection if you like just have to eat ice <laughs> that compulsive eating and crunching of ice that can be a sign of iron deficiency it's called pica um, sores around your mouth or a red sore tongue pale skin color if you're not normally that pale or pale tongue um, and inside your eyelids yeah so um, spooning of your fingernails or flattening of your fingernails and um, some markings on them as well like the lines on them it can be not diagnostic but an indication that you might need some more um, iron and dizziness there as well so Okay, so there's lots of different signs and symptoms. Maybe some of those are there for you, but I just want to touch on how do you know because some of those things could be related to other nutrients or other dysfunction in your body. So let's talk about iron deficiency diagnosis. How do you get it? Well, first of all, I'm going to just grab out my soapbox and I am going to have a little rant um, about the lab ranges. So if you have a blood test to test if you're iron deficient, well, those lab ranges are pretty cruddy. They are going to, they're, they're so low that you'd be feeling rubbish well before you get outside the normal range. So you could be symptomatic for weeks or months with iron deficiency symptoms and still be normal or fine. You're fine. Uh, and you're feeling rubbish still. So my um, blood test decoder has the optimal ranges for your red blood cells and your full blood count, your B vitamins and your iron studies. And they're the blood tests that I want you to get done, but I also want you to use those optimal ranges because that's what we should be aiming for. And that's what we deserve is actually to be in our optimal state of health, not just a, oh, well, you're fine. Like, you know, you're not, there's not a disease or disorder going on right at this moment. Um, but yeah, you're probably feeling really rubbish in between them. So full blood count, iron studies, including ferritin, and a decrease in ferritin will often come before other signs of deficiency. That's why I love testing it because we get to see before uh, the other markers in your blood might show that your iron stores are getting low. B vitamins like um, B9 and B12 are, are important too because they can contribute to anemia. It might not just be iron, it could be your B vitamins and your inflammatory markers too, because we know that inflammation can make your iron levels look high when they're actually not really, because your body will try and hide iron away from bacteria or something else. In the case of inflammation, it tucks more iron from your blood into ferritin and hides it away so that those bacteria or microbes can't use the iron to replicate 
Our bodies, are, they are really clever. They're really awesome. Like I said, we just got that little blip with the heavy bleeding, but otherwise, you know, they're amazing. So, and for some cases, they might want to look at other bloods like your zinc and copper, which influence your iron metabolism as well. But, you know, at a baseline, that's what you'd be looking for. Your doctor may or may not want to do those depending on your history, but you can always get them done via a naturopath or a nutritionist like myself. They won't be bulk billed, but you can always pay for them and they're not too expensive, especially when we use them from a functional perspective as we do. We get a broader idea of what else is happening in your body there as well. They allow us to make inferences or um, really good estimates of what's happening in your other systems of your body. So go download the blood test decoder grab out your past blood test results or go see a GP and get your annual test done and compare them and let me know where do you sit I want to know what's your iron levels <laughs> are you deficient if you're not deficient in that I bet you're deficient in vitamin D <laughs> there's a whole other podcast right so now we know why you might be iron deficient well or what your symptoms are and what your risk factors are how are we going to change it? Well, first of all, we're not going to just take a chemist supplement like Ferrograd or Multifer. Uh, why? Because they don't work for the most people. Uh, all they'll do is give you a constipation. And that's why a lot of the time you might stay deficient because you stop taking it because it gives you bloating, constipation, black stools, and you just feel really rubbish. Uh, and that's because the iron is not being absorbed from your intestines into your bloodstream. There's, there's a couple of reasons at play. It's the form of the um, nutrient that isn't great for the body and isn't well absorbed. And also the dose is too high and your body is very tightly regulates your iron metabolism, except in the heavy bleeding scenario. But anyway, iron running wild in your digestive system will cause damage and inflammation. Not what you want, not what your body wants there as well. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it slows down the getting rid of it because it gives you constipation and bloating. All right, so let's talk about what will help instead. I want you to, well, I'm going to assume you're going to go to a your naturopath or a nutritionist and you're going to talk to them about an effective iron supplement that won't constipate you. Maybe your health food shop has a naturopath on the floor that you can talk with there if you want. Some chemists do as well um, and they have some nice practitioner strength or therapeutic strength products um, or I should say in the case of iron they'll have some lower dose ones in a much better form that you will absorb more iron from them so then you're going to take your supplement every second day and you're going to take it at bedtime and also I just want to add in here please I'm not giving you personalized health information I'm not giving you a prescription you need to work with a naturopath nutritionist or your gp to sort out what is right for you this is just general advice so um yeah so there's a gatekeeper in our body in our intestines that prevents too much iron from entering our system this is why we get constipated and bloated with those really big doses so when you take an iron supplement that gatekeeper it's called hepcidin is increased for 24 to 48 hours even if your body is desperate and starving for iron. So it takes 48 hours for that to come back down. So if you take a dose every day, you're just going to keep that gate shut and it's going to sit in your intestines and bother you. If the dose is too big, if it's over 48 milligrams of equivalent iron, it's going to shut the gate and it's going to stay in your gut and irritate you. So small dose every second night is what I tell my clients. Okay, so we need to support your gut health. I did talk about that. You know, it's not just about how much you consume. And I think Carly's story and, and many women's story there as well, where they're taking supplements or having infusions and all that sort of thing, and it's not sticking, it's not building their ferritin stores or their levels. And we know it's something else that's going on. And we know, you know, you hear me talk about it all the time. We need to address the underlying causes or drivers of those symptoms for long-term resolution. So gut health, we know it's not just how much you take, it's how much how much you can break down and absorb and utilize. And that magic all happens in your gut. So you need good acid levels in your stomach and robust enzyme levels in your intestines. And of course, you need to eat enough of it 
um, to build your levels there as well or regularly enough. Now, I want you to be careful with coffee because, you know, maybe you heard that tea, you shouldn't have lots of tea around your iron supplements or iron rich meals because it binds the iron and makes it unavailable to your body. But also coffee does similar. It's been shown to inhibit iron absorption by up to 90%. So the important thing is that when coffee or tea is drunk with around your meal or your iron supplement, you are not going to absorb it. So what you want to do is have your food and then have your coffee or tea at least 60 minutes after your iron supplement or meal. And it doesn't do not have it an hour before your meal. Don't work the system that way because that is going to um, increase your cortisol levels and adrenaline, leave you more stressed. Uh, hangry and shaky for the day especially at 3 p.m it's also going to influence your gut irritate your gut and reduce your gut function so it's going to work against you please don't Uh, coffee in you know after food in the morning is much nicer for your body than that harsh jolt first up okay so Yeah, there's no point in having an amazing diet if you're not able to break down the food and get the nutrients out of that food and absorbed into your cells. And also there's lots of factors, cofactors, vitamins, minerals. They need to be at good levels for um, iron absorption and assimilation and use. So, you know, those strategies are essential for maintaining your energy and your overall health and your iron levels but like I said you do need to address the common underlying factors like the estrogen highs that can come in perimenopause the thyroid dysfunction hypothyroidism Hashimoto's can significantly impact your iron levels Um, and there may be other causes like heavy bleeding and so finding out what is contributing to that heavy bleeding besides your low iron stores which you could argue are just a symptom of that What else is contributing to what's going on there? And that's why, you know, it's one thing to do your basics on your own, but working with a professional who has experience and can see it out on the outside looking can make it so much more efficient. And if you're already feeling foggy and and lethargic from low iron, it's really difficult to think through all the information that you may find on the internet. Um, So yeah, do check in with someone who is passionate about helping you find the underlying cause or driver of what is happening for you. So my friends, that is all for today. Thank you so much for joining me as we talk through iron deficiency in perimenopause. And I hope that those tips are useful for you. Don't forget to check out my blood test decoder guide and also the Chaos to Calm Masterclass. Both of those are free. They'll give you more insights on blood testing, my thoughts on it um, and why I love doing it for my clients and why you should love doing it too, and the optimal ranges for your best state of health. So thank you so much for joining me. Next time we will be debunking common myths about life in perimenopause after 40. I hope you'll join me for that. I look forward to doing some myth busting. I love it. In the meantime, have a wonderful week. Thank you again for joining me. And I hope that you can find your calm in the chaos of perimenopause. It's really common for women over 40 to experience the chaos of changing hormones, mood, metabolism, and energy. But I hope you know now that common doesn't have to equal normal for you or them. You can help others understand they aren't alone in feeling this way and that perimenopause doesn't have to be horrific by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing this podcast with other women in their 40s and beyond. Thanks so much for listening and sharing your time with me today in this Chaos to Calm conversation.